Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. BetterHelp is not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It's professional counselling done securely online and it's available for clients worldwide. Members of the case file team use BetterHelp to bounce thoughts off a licensed professional and get ideas from a different perspective. The online journal means that team members can write to their counsellor when they have time and receive timely and thoughtful feedback without having to wait for a scheduled appointment. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counsellors if needed. Because it's online, they can offer a broad range of expertise that may not be available to you locally. Visit betterhelp.com slash casefile. That's better, H-E-L-P. And to join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counsellors in all 50 states. As a special offer for Casefile listeners, get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash casefile. Our episodes deal with serious and often distressing incidents. If you feel at any time you need support, please contact your local crisis centre. For suggested phone numbers for confidential support, please see the show notes for this episode on your app or on our website. In April 1977, Bev Roberts was anxiously awaiting the Easter long weekend. Her younger brother, Russell Martin, had abruptly left town earlier that year, leaving behind his wife and four young children. It wasn't out of character for Russell to take off from time to time, but he always kept in touch. This time, no one had heard from him. Russell was born and raised in the small, regional town of Stahl in Victoria's West. Stahl meant a lot to the 31-year-old. The heritage Gold Rush era township prospered during the 1850s mining boom, attracting a population of more than 30,000 people. When the yields were no longer commercially viable by the mid-1920s, the population began to dwindle. Those who remained were small-town families, farmers and retirees, those who preferred a quiet way of life among a close-knit community. By the 1970s, the population of Stahl was around 6,000 residents, many of whom struggled to find steady employment. Most of the manufacturing industries had closed and the railway depot had been relocated, leaving few job opportunities. The town relied heavily on tourism and hospitality, an industry serviced by the town's proximity to the sprawling, forest-covered mountain ranges of the Grampians National Park. It was the landscape and lifestyle Stahl offered that kept Russell Martin from leaving town for good. His social life revolved around the local pubs and footy club, where he was known by his mates as Stabber, and would delight crowds with his piano accordion. No matter where he went or why, Russell's journey always led him back home. Bev was hoping Russell would return for the biggest event on the town's calendar, the Stall Gift. Occurring over the Easter long weekend, the Stall Gift is the oldest and richest short-distance foot race in Australia. It draws in large crowds of participants, supporters and punters from across the country and further afield. Russell Martin always looked forward to the gift. Bev knew that if her brother didn't turn up to place a bet on the races, something was terribly wrong.
The 1977 stall gift came and went with no sign of Russell Martin. On May 3, Bev and her mother Ellen visited the local police station to file a missing persons report. It had been three and a half months since Russell left town unexpectedly without offering a goodbye. Bev and Ellen knew better than most that Russell was not a perfect person. He had his vices, mainly drinking and gambling, and was hot-headed and prone to violence. But he loved his children. Whenever he was out of town, Russell would at the very least keep in touch with his kids. Yet, they hadn't heard from him. Knowing her son's temperament, Ellen feared that Russell would cause harm if he returned to town. He would be incensed to find out that his wife, Helen, had moved another man into their marital home. Russell and Helen's relationship dated back to when they were teenagers. Russell's siblings disapproved of the pairing from the outset. Helen Wilcock had a reputation as a wild child, and Russell was possessive and prone to jealousy. They advised against the couple marrying, but Russell and Helen went ahead with the ceremony. In 1964, they became Mr. and Mrs. Martin. Both were 19 years old. They had four children and eventually settled into a three-bedroom weatherboard house on Ligar Street, not far from the main street of Stall. Their daughters, Lee and Kelly, shared one room. Their sons, Stephen and Paul, shared the second. Russell and Helen had the third. It wasn't an idyllic marriage. Russell and Helen were products of disadvantaged backgrounds and it influenced their treatment of one another. Russell was the sixth of seven children, born on July 10, 1945. His parents, Michael and Ellen, were problem drinkers. They would often stay out all night until they'd spent all their money or were escorted home by police. Some of their drinking binges lasted weeks. They fought loudly and frequently over their many problems, including Ellen's flagrant infidelity. Throughout his childhood, Russell was at the centre of a rumour regarding the identity of his biological father. He was also bullied for being the child of the town drunks, as well as for his poor hygiene and academic struggles. The Martin children were severely neglected by their parents. Child protection officers visited the household, but the children would hide in the nearby forest to avoid them. Sometimes they'd sleep out there for days at a time and arrive at school dirty and unkempt. Russell was teased for having burrs stuck in his knotty hair. He would try to remove them himself, but the results were disastrous and only caused more ridicule. Russell learned to retaliate with his fists and became known as a fierce fighter who wasn't afraid of anyone. Helen had experienced her husband's violence firsthand. Police officers attended domestic disputes at the couple's house sometimes as often as once a month, but charges were rarely laid. Helen felt sorry for Russell. She believed he only acted the way he did because of his upbringing, which had caused him to hate women. When reporting her son missing, Ellen Martin expressed concern for Helen in particular. She feared that Russell would harm his wife if he found out she had moved on with another man. Ellen said that the only way Helen would have a new boyfriend was if she knew for sure that Russell was never coming back. Russell's sister, Bev, felt Helen had been behaving suspiciously since January. For New Year's, Russell and Helen took their children on a lakeside camping trip 160 kilometres west of Stall. It was the couple's first holiday together in their 13-year relationship. Bev tagged along for the first few days of the trip. 
On several occasions, Helen left the campsite without good explanation. The Martins returned to stall around to January 13, and Russell continued his woodcutting business. He spent the next few days chopping up some wood so he could sell it. Then, on Tuesday, January 25, Helen visited Bev. She asked if Bev could deliver the wood to one of Russell's customers. It was a strange request. Bev wondered why her brother had gone to the effort to prepare the wood, only to not follow through with its sale. According to Helen, Russell had spent Tuesday, January 18 in bed. At 11.10pm, he asked her for the time and date. When Helen answered, he got up and said he had to go out for a minute. He returned at 1.20am to pick up some clothing, his toothbrush and toothpaste. He placed $100 cash on the bench along with the new watch that Helen had given him for Christmas. He told her to sell it and anything else she needed. Russell then apparently said, I can never come back to stall again. I'm sorry. I'm glad we had the holiday. He told Helen to prepare herself for a couple of shocks and then walked out the front door. Helen ran to the window and saw the back end of what looked like a white wagon or panel van. Russell got into the passenger seat and the car took off. Helen begged Bev not to tell anybody. She said it was likely that Russell had just been drunk and would be back soon. She wanted to avoid the humiliation of people knowing he had left her again. Russell had previously had an affair that resulted in a child. During that time, he periodically went back and forth between both women until his lover moved away. Bev knew Russell could take off for several days or weeks at a time, so Helen's story sounded plausible enough. She did think it was strange that he left while nursing a broken ankle. In fact, she was certain he was still relying on crutches to get around. She couldn't imagine why or how he would go travelling in such a condition. Nevertheless, she figured he would be back soon as he couldn't stand to be away from his children for long. A few days later, Bev and Helen spoke again. On this occasion, Helen said she had been mistaken about the date that Russell left. It had been the previous Thursday, not the Tuesday. She then broke down in tears, telling Bev that some money had gone missing from the Glenorchy Football Club and she believed Russell had taken it. He had played for the club before it folded due to poor performance and low player numbers. When the club's accounts were finalised, only a small amount of money remained in the treasury. It was obvious that someone appropriated what little funds had been in there. Helen Martin immediately fell under suspicion. She was the club's secretary and treasurer and was responsible for taking the money to be banked each week. Meetings were held to determine what happened to the missing money, but each time Helen provided an excuse as to why she couldn't attend. Helen claimed it was Russell who took the club's money. She said he used it to gamble and promised to return it from his winnings or the following week's earnings. Helen always gave her husband the money to avoid conflict and because he would take it anyway. In the end, he borrowed more than he repaid. By season's end, there was almost no money in the club's bank account. Following this revelation, Bev offered to pay her brother's debt to avoid community backlash. She gave Helen $1,000 to pay a grocer, a baker, and an electrical retailer that provided a TV for a club raffle. The bill came to $924.
Helen kept the remainder for incidentals, promising to pay it back at a later date. A little while later, Bev bumped into Helen at the local milk bar. Helen asked if she had heard any talk around town about Russell. Bev said she hadn't, to which Helen allegedly remarked, Isn't it good that nobody's talking? A few days after Russell allegedly left town, Helen pestered his brother, Michael, to clear up her yard using his front-hand loader. Michael didn't like Helen, but agreed for the sake of his nieces and nephews. Helen watched him work from the back doorstep and gave him $10 when the job was done. Michael was unaware Russell had left town, and Helen didn't mention it to him. Afterwards, she began returning tools and other items that Russell had borrowed from Michael and his other brother, Trevor. They were surprised when she told them that Russell wouldn't be coming back. Trevor later joked to his wife that he didn't think they'd be seeing Russell again because Helen had probably killed him. In the weeks following Russell's departure, Helen applied for maintenance and welfare for their children. She also sold some of his possessions and organised buyers for his farming machinery and vehicle. Russell's uncle, Billy Moller, gave Helen $500 not to sell the machinery, as Russell would need it when he came home. Russell also kept bees as a side hobby and made a small amount of money as an apiarist. Not wanting Russell's bee boxes to go to just anyone, Billy Moller convinced his nephew Kenny to buy them. As he took the boxes away, Kenny noticed some had blood on them. Helen said it was from a pig they had slaughtered a few weeks earlier. Kenny stored the boxes in a shed, unsure what else to do with them. Helen then traded in Russell's car for $350 and purchased a new one for $1,900. In late March, she met railway worker Mick Miller. Mick was new in town, and within two weeks of meeting Helen, he had moved into the house she had shared with Russell on Ligar Street. Bev was shocked to hear about the relationship and confronted Helen. She asked whether Helen had heard any news from Russell. Helen claimed she had tried to report him missing, but was told by the police officer on duty, he's over 21, he can look after himself, and that he was probably with another woman. Helen assured Bev she would contact her police officer cousin to see if he could locate Russell. From then on, the two women had nothing to do with each other. Bev was sure that Russell would return for the stall gift in April. When he didn't show, she knew something wasn't right. She headed to the stall police station with her mother, Ellen, to formally report Russell as a missing person. Senior Constable Richard Kennedy took the report. He was familiar with Russell Martin due to his run-ins with local authorities in the past. Russell had been charged with drink driving, refusing to provide his details following an accident, and the assault of two police officers. A gun-wielding Russell once threatened an officer after receiving a speeding ticket. On another occasion, he fired a shotgun into the air twice when the service at a drive through bottle shop was too slow. Then there were the regular visits to the Martin household in relation to domestic violence. For two hours that afternoon, Constable Kennedy interviewed Helen Martin about her missing husband. She repeated a similar story to the one she had told Bev, adding that Russell appeared upset and might have been crying when he left. He wouldn't tell her where he was going, just that he had to leave. 
he encouraged her to sell everything, including his tools, to try and get herself out of debt. Helen couldn't recall Russell's outfit that night, but saw him take a pair of jeans, trousers, a couple of shirts, underpants and socks with him. He put the clothes in a paper bag, but left behind his toiletries and a new wristwatch. He was in a hurry and left within minutes. Helen watched the white panel van Russell had climbed into pull away from the house. She believed there might have been one or two more passengers inside. Two weeks later, Helen saw a similar white car parked outside her house. An unknown man was sitting inside. She first noticed him at 7.30pm. He remained there for the rest of the night. Helen was too frightened to go out and see who it was. Unable to sleep, at 2am she resorted to taking three sleeping tablets to bypass her anxiety. Helen told Constable Kennedy that there were several rumours circulating around a stall regarding Russell's whereabouts. People had placed him all over Australia for various reasons. Some believed that Russell had been dealing drugs and ran off with his former lover. Others speculated that he was just over an hour's drive away in the regional city of Ballarat. This rumour placed Russell in Ballarat's psychiatric hospital, possibly because he had been treated there in the past for agoraphobia. Investigators noted that Helen appeared at ease during questioning. She admitted that she had entered a new relationship with Mick Miller, but denied they were living together. She said she wasn't sure what Russell would do if he came home and found them together, but conceded that he might try to injure her or Mick. Records confirmed that Mick hadn't arrived in stall until February 27, just over a month after Russell had disappeared. Due to this timing, investigators didn't consider him a suspect. Helen was evasive about the money stolen from the Glenorchy Football Club. She told police that she had been left with many debts, which she was paying off in instalments. Her efforts to locate her husband had only involved a discussion about the situation with her cousin, who happened to be a police officer. From Helen's point of view, there was nothing unusual about her husband disappearing for an extended period of time. Constable Kennedy didn't feel that Helen was being completely honest. He made inquiries with Russell's family, friends and neighbours to piece together his last known movements. He discovered that on Tuesday, January 18, Russell had visited his local doctor's office. Just over two months prior, Russell had broken his ankle after falling off the back of a horse. His checkup in mid-January confirmed the injury was healing well. Another appointment was made for Russell to attend a physiotherapy session two weeks later. The following day of Wednesday, January 19, Russell's neighbour, Charlie Stenhouse, visited the Martin family. Charlie told police that Russell was sick in bed at the time. He was wearing nothing but his underwear, while Helen applied ice packs to his head. Charlie described Russell as delirious. He was barely able to raise his head from his pillow. At one stage, Russell looked at his neighbour and said, Oh Charlie, before dropping his head back in exhaustion. Helen had told police that Russell left that night, but Charlie was certain Russell was in no state to leave home. Charlie visited the Martin house on the following Thursday, Friday and Saturday to check in on Russell. Each time, Helen met him at the front door. She said that Russell was too sick to come out and that she didn't want to disturb him. On the fourth day, Helen broke down in tears and told Charlie, 
I've been telling you a lie about him being asleep. You'll hear about it from somebody else anyway, so I might as well tell you. He's cleared off and left me. Constable Kennedy felt that Charlie's recollections were authentic and believed he was the last person, other than Helen, to have seen Russell prior to his disappearance. The night that Russell had allegedly left home, Charlie's wife, Dory, heard a gunshot echo down the street. She discussed the noise with another neighbour, Mavis, the following morning. Mavis told Dory that she had also heard the gunshot. But when police were making their inquiries into Russell Martin's disappearance, Mavis backpedalled and denied hearing the sound. She said she didn't want to get involved. Dory maintained she heard it. She also elaborated on the camping trip the Martin family had taken for New Year's. Dory and Charlie joined the Martins at the lake a few days into the holiday and recalled Russell and Helen having a huge fight. Russell stormed off down the beach and Helen followed him in tears. They returned about half an hour later, but there was still tension between them. The following day, Dory and Helen went into the nearest town to have a beer. Helen was still upset, but didn't tell Dory what the argument was about. She said she wanted to leave Russell, but was afraid of what he would do. She also confided that Russell had been leaving the house late at night. She suspected he might have been having another affair. Dory couldn't remember if Russell was on crutches during the holiday. She was aware that Helen left the campsite alone a few times to buy food from the nearest town. During the trip, Helen had also returned to stall twice on her own to collect mail and to pick up a mattress. There were reports that at around the time Russell went missing, Helen had been asking around for sleeping tablets. She hadn't done this before. Given the amount of time that had since passed, nobody could remember the exact date Helen was making these inquiries. When questioned, Helen told police she sought out the pills in the week after Russell went missing because she was unable to sleep. Several people also told police about the money that had gone missing from the Glenorchy Football Club. Most believed Helen was responsible for the theft. Constable Kennedy viewed Helen with suspicion, describing her as, quote, a cunning type of person and a poor manager of money. Every person he spoke to agreed that if Helen had any idea that Russell was coming back, she would never have had another man in the house because Russell would kill them both. He contacted Helen's police officer cousin, Sergeant Royce Weir. She claimed to have spoken to her cousin after Russell went missing for the purpose of locating him. Sergeant Weir denied any such interaction took place. Russell's brother, Michael, had been paid by Helen to clean up her yard a few days after Russell went missing. Constable Kennedy wondered whether Helen had used this opportunity to remove or destroy evidence or to create a diversion or alibi. Police followed up with a friend of Russell's named Alan Frayne. One of the many rumours surrounding Russell's disappearance accused Alan of helping Russell leave Stall by driving him into state. Alan admitted that he had travelled to Sydney around the time Russell went missing, but denied taking his friend with him. There was also a rumour circulating that at around that time, Alan had paid to have a concrete slab hastily installed on his property. Without seeking council approval, he had allegedly hired two local men to get the job done cheaply. The slab was laid down and a frame for a building was erected on top. 
Alan quickly realised that he'd gotten what he paid for when the slab had too many cracks to maintain any structural integrity. The building was abandoned and townsfolk gossiped that Russell could be buried beneath the slab. Constable Kennedy sensed Alan Frame knew more than he was willing to tell police. Many stall residents were certain Russell had stayed true to character and simply cleared off. Some believed Russell's psychiatric history was the reason for him going missing or that his mental health issues had led to self-harm. Russell's general practitioner described him as suffering from, quote, mental hysteria, but his detailed psychiatric records were subject to patient confidentiality and couldn't be accessed. Others, including investigators, were more open to the possibility that Russell had met with foul play. During such deliberations, Helen Martin emerged as a person of interest. She had plenty of motives from having sustained years of abuse, gambling, infidelity and threats by her husband. It was an open secret around town that the only way she could leave her marriage in a way that guaranteed her safety was if Russell was dead. However, it seemed unlikely Helen could orchestrate carry out and cover up the murder alone. There were lingering suspicions around people like Alan Frame and the timely installation of the concrete slab. But then, there were more damning allegations. Like many country towns at the time, there was significant friction between law enforcement and the local men doing it tough. Everyone knew that Russell clashed with the police more than most. However, nobody could recall a specific incident that would have been the catalyst for murder. Although Russell had a terrible rapport with local police, he was good mates with an officer named Peter Ivy. Ivy had just recently been stationed at Stall. In his spare time, he coached and recruited players for the Glenorchy Football Club. Despite their differences, Ivy and Russell bonded through the club and established a close friendship. They arrived at training together, went out drinking after games and socialised as a group with their wives. Rumours alleged that Ivy was having an affair with Russell's wife. Several people witnessed a fight between Russell and Ivy and speculated there was truth to the rumour. When asked about their reported affair by investigators, both Helen and Ivy were steadfast in their denial. Ivy also rejected claims that he and Russell had gotten into a fight. This was despite several witnesses, including Helen, stating otherwise. With no evidence that a crime had been committed, the investigation into Russell Martin's disappearance dwindled. Helen and Mick's relationship continued, with neither seemingly worried that Russell could return home at any minute. Helen sold Russell's saw bench, tractor and most of his possessions, using some of the proceeds to pay off debt collectors. Helen's brother, Philip Wilcock, told police that he avoided Helen as much as possible. He referred to her as a compulsive liar. Here's the thing about home security companies. Most trap you with high prices, tricky contracts and lousy customer support. So while there are a lot of options out there, there's only one no-brainer. Simply safe. Simply Safe has everything you need to protect your home with none of the drawbacks of traditional home security. You can set Simply Safe up yourself in under an hour without the need of a technician. Just peel and stick the sensors exactly where you need them and your home will be monitored day and night by professionals ready to send police, fire or medical to your home if there's an emergency. Best of all, there are no contracts, 
no pushy salespeople, no hidden fees or fine print. Simply Safe will supply you with an arsenal of sensors tailored specifically for your home so you can rest assured that every room, window and door you need covered will be covered. And all of this starts at just $15 a month. Head to simplysafe.com slash casefile and you can get yourself a free HD camera. That's simplysafe.com slash casefile to make sure they know that our show sent you. Have you heard about this company making stylish, sustainable shoes and bags made for life on the go? They're carefully crafted with eco-friendly materials like repurposed plastic water bottles and marine plastic. Rothy's shoes are incredibly comfortable with zero break-in period thanks to their seamlessly knit-to-shape design. With so many chic styles to choose from, Rothy's shoes are the perfect pair for any adventure. Casefile writer Elsha can't rave about her Rothy's enough. As soon as they arrived in the mail, she fell in love. Elsha says they're the most comfortable shoes she's ever owned and look great. From the product range to the fast shipping to Rothy's commitment to zero waste manufacturing, the shoes get two big thumbs up. The best thing ever? Rothy's are fully machine washable. Every time they need a refresh, you can simply toss them in the washing machine. It's no surprise to see Rothy's most popular shoe, the Point in Black, has over 3,000 near-perfect reviews. Check out all the amazing shoes and bags available right now at rothys.com slash casefile. That's rothys.com, R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash casefile. Style and sustainability meet to create your new favourites. Head to rothys.com slash casefile today. A lot is up in the air right now, especially when it comes to our personal finances. Eating out at restaurants has now become meals delivered to home, and online shopping has become the norm. If spending money while you spend more time indoors is getting you down, Simplify is here to help. Start healthier financial habits and achieve your long-term goals with Simplify. Simplify makes it easy to see the big picture, stay on top of your spending and save like a pro. With more than 30 years of personal finance expertise built into one easy-to-use platform, Simplify is more comprehensive than other apps without any third-party ads. It makes it easy to monitor all of your spending habits so you're never in the dark like surprise changes from subscriptions you forgot you signed up for. Simplify focuses on insights, not input. There's no judgement. They won't overwhelm you with every dollar you're off by. See why the New York Times Wirecutter is calling Simplify by Quicken the best budgeting app out there. Start your free 30-day trial of Simplify today when you download the app or visit simplifymoney.com. That's S-I-M-P-L-I-F-I money dot com. A year after her brother vanished without a trace, Bev Roberts hired a private investigator. It was a last-ditch effort to get some answers. Her finances were limited she couldn't afford much more than a basic search. The PI interviewed Helen Martin and did find some minor discrepancies and deviations from her earlier statements, but there wasn't enough to reinvigorate the investigation. Russell's family spent the following years chasing up alleged sightings. A man named Wayne Yole told Russell's mother, Ellen, that he had seen Russell at a cafe in the Victorian town of Swan Hill. Wayne assured her that Russell was fine and told her not to worry. Later, Wayne admitted to concocting the sighting with a local publican because Ellen was coming in so often lamenting about her missing son. They had decided to make up the story in order to take the pressure off her. Russell's uncle, Billy Moller, travelled to different towns and questioned locals. 
whenever he heard a rumour that Russell was spotted somewhere nearby, Billy would investigate the lead himself. It was rumoured that Billy was Russell's biological father. Whether or not it was true, the pair had shared a close, father-son-like bond since Russell was a boy. Billy kept searching for Russell until his death a couple years later. His nephew Kenny told investigators, Any little thread Billy could grab, he always looked into it to see if there was any evidence anywhere. In 1979, Russell's mother passed away. Despite his difficult childhood, Russell loved his mum and was fiercely protective of her. Those who believed Russell was still alive were convinced he would return for the funeral. Yet, the service concluded and there was no sign of him. Even the most open-minded store residents took Russell's absence as proof he was deceased. It was enough of a reason for the police to give the case one final look. Russell's missing person file had been taken over by Sergeant James Holcomb. On June 6, 1979, Sergeant Holcomb re-interviewed Helen Martin. He presented the discrepancies and inconsistencies in her statements and put forth a series of allegations that implicated her in Russell's death. It was a long and probing interview, but Sergeant Holcomb was unable to draw a definitive conclusion regarding Helen's possible involvement. Inquiries were made to government agencies, banks and utility providers, but there was no record of Russell Martin following his alleged departure from Stahl in 1977. Once again, the case went cold. His file was marked inactive with the general consensus being that Russell was deceased, though the cause remained a point of contention. Helen and Mick Miller broke up after several years due to infidelity on Mick's behalf. Soon after, Helen started a relationship with a local slaughterman named Charles Smith. Smith had a criminal history that included assault of a police officer's son and carnal knowledge of a girl between 10 and 16 years of age. Smith was married when he met Helen, but left his wife to move in with Helen and her four children at their home on Ligar Street. The couple married in September 1983 and Helen took on her husband's surname. Two thousand one marked twenty four years since Russell went missing. It was announced that a coronial inquest would be conducted the following year to determine what likely happened to Russell. In the lead up, detectives made further inquiries and re interviewed those connected to the case. A couple of Russell's friends and acquaintances told a story about a local panel beater named Bill Joyner who often repaired damaged police vehicles. Around the time of Russell's disappearance, a police officer allegedly visited Bill in the middle of the night. He insisted that a repair be done urgently and discreetly. There was a large dent in the bonnet of the officer's police car that looked like it could have been made by a kangaroo. But that explanation didn't account for the secrecy of the job. One man swore that it had been a human-shaped dent. By the time detectives were informed of this alleged incident, Bill Joyner was deceased and could not be called upon to confirm or deny. Stories also arose that Russell had attended a wild party on the night of his disappearance. Police officer Peter Ivey was also said to have been at the party. At one stage, Both men got into a massive fight. Russell left for a brief period, then returned with a knife. He threw it in the sink and declared that a local man named Danny Marks, quote, wouldn't be using that again. However, it seemed like these were misremembered events. The party in question was not held the night Russell disappeared. 
It was held to mark the end of the football season, which occurred months prior. Danny Marks, who Russell had mentioned in relation to the knife, had no recollection of the incident. Russell's neighbour, Charlie Stenhouse, had seen Russell the day of his disappearance bedridden, exhausted and in ill health. Charlie had since passed away, but his recollections did not support the theory that Russell was out partying. Detectives interviewed Billy Moller's nephew, Kenny, who had bought Russell's bee boxes from Helen in 1977. He had noticed there was blood on them. Helen had told him the source was a slaughtered pig. On January 30, 2001, Police went to Kenny's house to get the boxes from his shed, where they had been left untouched for over two decades. Several of the boxes were engraved with the number M437, which was Russell's beekeeping license number. Others had his name written on them in texta. The bloodstained boxes were nowhere to be found. There were two boxes and some frames marked with a red substance, but Kenny didn't believe these were the ones that had caught his attention in 1977. Testing confirmed the red substance wasn't blood. Detective Mark McCann had since taken over Russell Martin's case as the lead investigator. On March 8, 2001, he re-interviewed Helen Martin, now Helen Smith. He addressed the inconsistencies in her statements. She had told one officer that Russell had left $100 on the bench before he left, but had denied this to another. Helen had talked about being deep in debt, yet had purchased a new vehicle several weeks after Russell went missing. She also claimed that two males from out of town had shown up at her house after Russell left, wanting to purchase drugs. Detective McCann deemed this unlikely, as no one throughout the 24-year investigation had ever mentioned that Russell used drugs, other than prescription medication. On March 14, police re-interviewed Russell's friend Alan Frame, about the hastily laid concrete slab on his property. Alan continued to deny any knowledge of Russell's disappearance, but officers felt he was hiding something. A week later, they arrived at Alan's property with scientists from Monash University. A geoscope search was carried out on the slab. It came up with a negative result meaning there was no justification to dig it up. The coroner's inquest into Russell Martin's disappearance began in May 2002. By this time, his four adult children had varying levels of interest in finding out what happened to their father. The eldest, Lee, had just started grade six when her dad went missing. She had been away at school camp at the time. When she returned home, Helen had told her that Russell was on holiday. Lee continually asked her mother where her father was and when he was coming back, but Helen never spoke about it. Later in life, Lee had come to the conclusion that Russell was still alive. When asked how her mother felt about him leaving, Lee said, She was probably relieved because dad used to hit her. The second eldest, Kelly, was seven at the time and didn't remember Russell. All she knew of him was that her mother said he was an asshole. Kelly was convinced her father was most likely dead and she believed at the rumours around town that the local police had something to do with it. Stephen, who was six when his dad went missing, said that Helen never talked about Russell. Stephen said, She might know something, but I know there's a lot more people who know a hell of a lot more. The youngest, Paul, couldn't remember anything about his dad. 
He too had heard people say that the police had given his father a hiding and that they had thrown his body down a mine shaft. The location of Stall on the edge of the Victorian goldfields meant there were hundreds of disused mine shafts nearby. Locals often used them to illegally dump rubbish and other refuse. There were rumours that the local police disposed of old vehicle number plates in the mines rather than do the paperwork to deregister them correctly. By the time of the inquest, it had been 25 years since Russell Martin vanished. Memories had faded. Witnesses provided contrasting recollections of the same events. Some referenced the gossip as fact, while others just wanted to inject themselves into the dramatic mystery. Key players wanted to minimise the role they played. Kenny Moller was grilled about the blood he saw on Russell's bee boxes. Some believed the story was made up or exaggerated to place suspicion on Helen. Helen's ex-boyfriend, Mick Miller, testified that Helen never spoke about Russell, nor did her children. Helen didn't fear his possible return either, as though certain he was gone for good. Mick was aware that Russell was violent and possessive, but it didn't bother him. He thought he could hold his own if Russell reappeared. Russell's son, Stephen, said that the court ought to hear from local police officer Murray Emerson. Emerson was known to have had bad blood with Russell. According to Stephen, it was Emerson who had taken his police wagon to get fixed at panel beater Bill Joyner's place. From what Stephen had heard, there had been blood all over the front of the vehicle as well as the large dent. Given that Helen had previously denied that the vehicle she saw Russell get into was a police car, Stephen was asked what he thought the connection was between the police wagon and his father's disappearance. He responded, I don't know. It's for you to find out. Sergeant James Holcomb took over Russell's missing person file in 1978. During the inquest, it was revealed that he had been safekeeping taped conversations that would provide useful information if Russell's body was ever found. The tapes included a recorded interview with Russell's former neighbour, Charlie Stanhouse. The other was a covertly recorded discussion with Helen. Russell's brother, Michael, voiced his belief that Helen was participating in several affairs at the time of Russell's disappearance. The first allegedly involved Billy Moller, Russell's uncle and rumoured biological father. Billy died prior to the inquest. The other alleged affair was Russell's former football coach, local police officer Peter Ivey. Ivy denied ever having a sexual relationship with Helen, stating, That amazes me that anyone's ever said that. I can't think of any situation that I've ever been in where someone would think something like that. Ivy said his memories of Russell were limited and that he couldn't recall whether he spoke to Helen about his disappearance. He also claimed not to know whether there was any domestic violence in their marriage. But when pushed, he said, Well, from my recollection, they did have a fiery type of marriage. They were a fiery couple. It was Russell's sister Bev and mother Ellen who had filed the official missing persons report to Senior Constable Kennedy in 1977. A second missing persons report was tendered in court that appeared to have been filed later by Helen and signed by Peter Ivey. Ivey said he didn't take the report, but couldn't explain why his name was on it. Helen was spoken to after Bev and Ellen made their initial report. No one was able to explain to the court why this second report was signed with Peter Ivey's name. 
Russell's youngest son, Paul, testified that he had recently been approached by a man who claimed to know where his father's body was. The man had taken him to the location the night before, but Paul had been unable to find it when he returned to the site on his own in the morning. He refused to name the man as he didn't want to get him in trouble. Paul said he would show the police the location once he had verified it during the daylight. Based on this tip-off, the court heard that members of the state emergency service attended an area at Green Lake. The off-stream reservoir and recreational area was 55 kilometres northwest of Storr. There, they located two sunken areas in the ground. They dug approximately one foot deep, but found no indication that anything was buried there. Over the years, suspicion had also been cast on Helen's new husband, Charles Smith. Charles testified that sitting in court was the first time he had ever heard that anyone thought Helen had something to do with it. He said he'd heard all kinds of rumours over the years, but never had any interest in delving into them further. He denied having ever met Russell and asserted that he had met Helen for the first time years after her husband's disappearance. This contradicted a statement made by Charles and Russell's mutual friend, Alan Frame. Alan said the men lived close to one another, moved in the same social circles, and had known each other from the pub. He considered it unlikely that they had never crossed paths. Helen appeared on the stand. She was asked whether she was concerned that Russell might return home to find she had moved on with another man. Helen responded, I was always concerned about him returning, yes, but I had to live my own life too. She denied having any involvement in or knowledge of any foul play against Russell. She said that she had provided police with the number plate details of the car she thought Russell had left in. Officers had no record of this information and suspected she was lying. Detective Mark McCann, who had taken over as lead detective on the case, told the court, I believe that Russell Martin has been murdered and I further believe that Helen Smith has more knowledge of it than she has led the court to believe thus far. On July 5, 2002, Coroner Timothy MacDonald handed down his findings. He deemed the evidence given by Helen, her husband Charles Smith, and former Stahl police officer Peter Ivey to be unconvincing and evasive. Quote, I am satisfied that the witness Peter Ivey was not a frank, open, or truthful witness in the evidence that he gave to the court. I did not accept that a person who was a police officer and who played sport with Russell Martin and drove his truck to assist him when he had a broken ankle would have such little memory of the details surrounding Martin going missing. He was an unreliable witness. Further, I am satisfied that Charles Smith knows more of the circumstances surrounding the disappearance of Russell Martin than what he has told investigators and this court. He was an evasive and vague witness who was hard to pin down to give clear and definitive evidence. Smith has indicated to investigators that he had little or no knowledge of Russell Martin at the time of his disappearance. He says he may have met him at a hotel at some time, but cannot recall this. This is inconsistent with the evidence of Alan Frayne. Because of the unreliability of Smith's evidence, I'm unable to accept his assertion that he was not known to Helen Martin prior to the 20th of January 1977. Helen Smith has also been vague, unclear, and misleading in what she has told different people about the circumstances of her husband's disappearance. What I'm satisfied of is that the behaviour of Helen Martin 
very shortly after she says her husband left home, is consistent with her knowing that he would never return. Other than saying that her husband told her he would not be returning, there is no evidence before this inquest for the court to find that it would be reasonable for Helen Martin to believe that this would be the case. Reasons for reaching this conclusion are the evidence before the court is that Russell Martin loved his children. He had strong family and other ties in store. Whenever he had left the matrimonial home on other occasions, he had always returned. Witnesses have given evidence that he would not leave store without ever having some contact with the people he loved. There is no reasonable explanation before the court as to why he would want to leave Stall permanently. Coroner MacDonald believed the information provided by Russell's now deceased neighbour, Charlie Stenhouse. Charlie said he had visited the Martin house on Wednesday, January 19 and saw Russell bedridden and in a delirious state. Coroner MacDonald Quote, I am satisfied that Helen Smith has not disclosed the true circumstances surrounding the disappearance of her husband to the court. Further, I'm satisfied that she possesses information that is likely to establish such circumstances. After taking into account all of the evidence before the court, I'm satisfied that the disappearance of Russell Martin on or about the 20th of January 1977 was associated with suspicious circumstances and that he died on or about that date from causes that were not natural. Despite these findings, there was no new information that warranted Russell's case being reinvestigated and no arrests were made. Russell's sister, Bev, was pleased with the coroner's findings, but disappointed that no further inquiries would take place. She provided a DNA sample to the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine to be compared with their collection of unidentified human remains. There wasn't a match. She tried every available avenue to have Russell's case heard or reinvestigated, and meticulously noted, filed, and reported every new lead that came her way. A person can only apply to the coroner to have a case reopened if there is substantial new information available. Bev has tried several times over the years to have Russell's case reopened. Recently, a local man came forward claiming to have seen Russell put into a police van by a known local officer never to be seen again. However, this claim didn't match with the timing of information known to be true, such as Russell's last doctor's appointment. In March 2020, Bev received a letter from the coroner's court saying they couldn't take the matter any further and that, quote, These inquiries have now been exhausted and therefore the police investigation is currently considered inactive. Most people want Bev to move on, due in part to Russell's history of violence and crime. Some may think Russell deserved his outcome, whatever it may have been. Bev accepts that her brother was no angel, but believes that justice should prevail. Judging victims of crime based on their character and only investigating the murders of those who are deemed good is not what the law is about. Bev is getting on in years and her health is beginning to fail her. Russell's brothers have passed away and she feels that she is the only one left who cares that he's gone. All she wants before she joins her brothers is to get some sort of resolution. For over two decades, Bev has written to police chiefs, lawyers, magistrates, coroners, and to the Missing Persons Advocacy Network. She has begged them all for the same thing. Please find out what happened to my brother. 
Russell.